speakers when I was starting. You have narrow enough? No, you're the keynote speaker today, Mike. <laughs> yes. Ready? You have to have droopy dog first. Okay, I'll grade oh. you. You failed, get out. Come on, hey, you. Hey, 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 That's an improper <laughs> posture on Robert Guy's right half. Unproper. Good morning, my name is Chris Nucky. These are my lab partners, Rob Gubb and Tom Anderson, and today we're going to talk about the use of IR for directionality. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we agreed on a common source for direction, which was the use of IR, and today we're going to discuss the testing of the emitter and, de and detector circuits that were built. Uh, the first stage of testing was uh, the building of the emitter circuit and the detector circuit without the use of the tone decoder. Uh, what was achieved was a solid DC signal when it was not detecting and a DC pulse signal when it was detecting. The span that it, would, that it reached was 56 feet and it roughly gave you about a 30 degree angle either side of it. Uh, Rob will now explain the circuitry behind the emitter and detector. Oh, Tom, if you would. Here you see the emitter and detector circuitry. Um, it's a basic schematic of the circuitry. I will be speaking about the uh, emitter circuit, which you see here. Um, what we originally tried to do was, because of the parameters of the uh, Archer detector which we're using, the GPU uh, 2x50A, um, it requires that you have a 40 kilohertz uh, carrier signal along with uh, whatever signal you wish to uh, be detecting. So what we uh, originally did was we put our, um, we built a 556 dual timer circuit, uh, having one end put out the 40 kilohertz signal and the other end putting out the uh, desired signal, which in our case was a 200 hertz signal. Uh, we then took these two signals and put them through an AND gate and put the output of the AND gate to the IR emitter. Uh, originally this seemed to work, work uh, pretty well, but um, after day or two, we found that it started to uh, not work as well as it originally had. So what we then decided to do was, instead of using the 556 dual timer, we decided uh, that because of uh, the parameters of the race, uh, we asked the instructor, we might just use signal generators and put them through the AND gate. Uh, so what we're doing now is putting 40 kilohertz signal with one signal generator and a 200 hertz signal with another generator into the AND gate uh, of the emitter. Uh, we found that that worked out uh, pretty well and the detector circuit was able to pick it up. But unfortunately, uh, we found that we didn't get a very good range on it. So then what we uh, decided to do was to pump up the current uh, coming out of the IR emitter by uh, putting a BJT transistor uh, between these two points here, which uh, now we found works out very well, thanks to a little help from uh, Mr. Schweitzer. Uh, and now we are able to get the full distance of the maze. Last night uh, we were actually able to get a full 63 feet. And now uh, my other partner, Tom Anderson, will speak about the circuit. Thank you, Rob. Um, probably now, at this point, after Rob spoke about the emitter, the most important part of our detector circuit, of the detector circuit itself, is the use of a tone, a tone, a tone decoder. Because the um, Archer receiver will pick up the 40 kilohertz carrier and only transfer a 200 hertz um, signal from the, uh, from the excuse me, the DC pulse from the, uh, from the receiver. Now, a, a 200 hertz DC pulse is not very useful, in, as, or it is useful, but it is not 
the ideal input we'd like to have into the microcontroller in order to determine which of the uh, which of the receivers is picking up the directionality of the robot. So the tone decoder was used in order to trans pick up a certain uh, pass frequency and then output a TTL high or low depending upon whether it was receiving or not. Um, right now, the, the tone decoder will output a high volt, a high five volts if it is um, if it is if it is not receiving, and will go low if it is receiving. The uh, basic circuit um, is is rather simple. The input of the uh, tone decoder is tied to the output of the receiver through a capacitor, and and certain capacitor values are used in order to find the centering frequency for the uh, tone decoder. <coughs> now, the, the tone decoder is rather sensitive. It only has about a 50 hertz uh, uh, or 100 hertz uh, band size. <coughs> so that the, the input uh, signal has to be within that certain range for us to 200 hertz in order to receive the signal. Um, right now, we're still testing, and it, it is working so far. And we'd like to open the floor for any further questions or comments that you might have. Yes, Mr. Shooter. Um, how difficult would it be just to copy a bunch of times the implement on all the robots and can't have it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Check on it. How many boards is it going to take on? No. The proper okay. question is, how much? <laughs> <laughs> no, you can't have it. No. Well, I love I'm the cooperation in this class. <laughs> <laughs> it's so touching. <laughs> just remember that my speech is next. Well, is my speech. Uh, if you like, uh, you can, of course, put as many detective circuits on your robot as you want. Uh, but one suggestion that I can think of offhand is to use simply one detective circuit and maybe a, a MUX or uh, something. Good idea. Oh, just off the top of my head, no less. Uh, a MUX so that you can uh, hook up maybe three detectors facing uh, at 90 degree angles from each other, and uh, and put those into one mux, and then that into the one detector circuit. Never happened. I think. Mr. Keith. Yeah. Um. What was the the frequency response of the the AND gate that you were using, or what AND gate were you using for the uh, the transmitter? I'll let you know. Uh, we were using a 7408, I believe it is, yeah, 7408 AND gate, um, and we simply put the two signals into uh, into the AND gate. We didn't have any problem as far as using uh, different frequencies. We were able to use, we used that all the way down from 200 hertz all the way up to uh, about 10k, and it was still able to, uh, the AND gate was still able to put that out. So, uh, we have, you know, 40 kilohertz signal. Yeah, the 40 kilohertz signal, which is needed for the, uh, for the archer detector is, is no problem. It, uh, we're adding that with, uh, signals from 200 all the way up to 10k all the whole time. Going back to Vista's question, uh, it's, it's not, it's not large, and, uh, in order for you not, in order for you to be able to gain a direction, you're going to need three just to have so that when you have the input to your mic control you can tell which one it is and so that you have different directions not just any one if it were one direction if you wanted to only have a front direction then you only need one but then you're going to but it's not it's not a difficult or a large circuit to reproduce one thing well, so basically you want to put three detectors on each robot Option, uh, uh, optimally, optimally, I think we should put four. I think we should put four detectors. Because the IR to get back through the maze. So you should want four detectors and four detector circuits? Four, or? four detectors, three detectors, four or three, right. one deco tone decoder, <laughs> and one mark. I've, I've got a question. Do we have the components available to build 20 of them? Let's hope so. Well, you want four on a robot. That's 20 detectors and five muxes and five. Oh, you need. I know we have the decoder. You need at least 15 of these uh, detector boxes. Uh, at least five tone decoders and five muxes. 
I think you may want to consider using the circuit that I described right into your microcontroller. It can save you time of picking up all the components because you can have as many as you want. If you use, if you use the microcontroller, then the input capture would be the tone decoder. And then you could have as many as you want. I reminded you. There is pulse open 40K and have the output of that in the microwave or the box. Go right into the microwave. You see the input capture. Remember that program that I put up there? I still got a lot of these monitors, though. We don't need 15 of those boxes. Why would you, why would you need 15? I'm not following the rationale. Well, let's see. If you're going to do that, you can have three emitter circuits instead of three detectors. No. Is that what you're talking about now? No. Well, I thought you would have. Emitters, you'd have the three emitters, right? The uh, one for one end of the maze, one for the other end, and one for the middle. Is it possible? Well, we were planning on having one at the end and having so the receivers, three different receivers on the robot, one forward at maybe a 60, 60, 60 to 90 degree swing from the front, two on the side. And so oh, it's going it's forward, if it's, if it's not picking up this or it's picking up the front one and the left one, it knows that it's going to the right and must correct left to get to the end of the maze. It would be more practical if you're going to use the microcontroller to decode to have just one receiver and have four different frequencies mm -hmm. on the four corners of the maze and then yeah. based your direction on the frequency you're in the microcontroller. I mean, if you're going to if you're going to use the microcontroller as a decoder chip, you know, there's no reason to have four different inputs to the microcontroller if you can do one. See, in, in each case, you're going to have to find it. And, and basically what you could do would be to have your main set up like this. And this would save essentially in, um, in really the number of um, circuits that you have to put on it and everything else. This is the main. You would put, say, 200 hertz there, 500 hertz there, Right. The weapons that you're going to pick up more than one. 
supposed to be a surprise, didn't it? Everybody knows. Mike told everybody last night. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
statistic from 1988, and in just two years, in 1990, you can see that piece of money from 6,000 units to approximately 7,500 units. So you can see the phenomenal growth in just about the piece of business, and just, just only over a little over two years. Now let's talk about some of the local business in the area. The main supplier to the pizza stores in this area is uh, Orlando's. And basically, I want to talk about the weekly sales. And basically, you see this 15,000 pounds of flour, 5,000 pounds of mozzarella, and 30,000 pizza boxes, 700 pounds of pepperoni, and 1,500 gallons of tomato sauce. They did try some, the owner did tell us about it, they did try to sell an invitation of mozzarella, but the public basically just hated it. Um, it he said that also that the pizza has been expanding uh, every year uh, due to the belief that it's a healthy food. And uh, this, this place operates with 13 employees and is running at seven days a week. I'd like to hand it over now to Michael to talk about more pizza. This is the basic cost of pizza. Basically, you can see the when you're buying a pizza, the owner is putting the most money into his cheese because it accounts for about 52% of the price of their pizza. The dough is a four runner for 34%, and the cheapest thing on there is a sauce, and that's 14%. I think that's because they put it on a little bit thin at most restaurants. If you're looking at a pepperoni pizza, you can see that pepperoni is the second most expensive item, so it actually supersedes dough. So when you're ordering a topping, it does cost the owner quite a bit of money to put that feature onto the pizza. Uh -oh. We're missing our famous uh, slide about the basically local prices that we did. We surveyed basically 14 restaurants, and we don't really have that slide now for some reason. But we decided that the cheapest uh, pizza restaurant here in Scranton is the one that Pat worked at, and that's Royal's Pizza. And the price at Royal's is $5.29 to have it delivered here at the University of Scranton. The most expensive pizza in Scranton is uh, Domino's Pizza, and that's $10.60 to have it delivered to your home. There you are. And there we go. We've got a lot. We've got all these places. And here's the cheapest, Royal's, and Domino's is the most expensive. We wanted to add our own restaurant, which got added, which was the Archives, and that just got added last year because they are a sort of demand for pizza, and but they don't deliver, so we had to leave them off the list. So you can see how much the university really goes out and tries to serve our needs. <laughs> so, <laughs> next time, next thing I'd like to talk about is delivery time. Domino's is very famous for its 30-minute delivery policy. As a matter of fact, advertisers have said, have said that Domino's has increased the popularity of pizza by guaranteeing a 30-minute delivery time to your home. The average pizza takes five and a half minutes to cook, and the total delivery time is 24 minutes. So that gives Domino's pizza a six-minute leeway. The next slide basically shows the nutritional information on pizza. The average serving size is 2.5 slices, so I think you can all see that we exceed the dietary recommendation by quite a bit. <laughs> we get 25 grams of protein, 54 grams of carbohydrate, 50 grams of fat, four, and this adds up to 450 calories. The general rule of thumb is it's about 9 calories for every gram of fat. So this basically adds up to be 30%, 33% of the calories are saturated fat calories. Now how does this add, uh, add up to other products in the market? Well basically I went out and got the Big Mac, and that has 540 calories with 32 grams of fat. And that basically says that 51% of the Big Mac is sim simply saturated fat, and it's going to give you a heart attack. So, <laughs> if you want to do electrical engineering for a lot of years, you have to go for pizza because your, your, uh, your risk for a heart attack will be reduced tremendously. And basically, if you look at the fruit groups, the grain is in the crust, so eat a pat, the dairy is in the cheese, and the fruits and vegetables, of course, you have the sauce. And if you want the meat group, uh, add the pepperoni on. And the last side is some interesting facts. Basically, in the United States, there's 53,000 pizzerias. 
They sell about 90 acres of pizza each day. <laughs> and Americans eat four times more pizza than they do apple pie. And that's basically the cool, cool message for today. Very interesting topic, which I was reading about last night, and they actually do, they're putting a lot of electronics into their, into their stores, and that's by making automated bake ovens for their pizza. One way that the pizza places can reduce the overhead costs is simply by automation, which your father is into, and that means that they put the pizza in the front end and they get it out the back end. So that's one way to maintain quality control. Another issue about quality control that I'd like to bring up right now is people think, they said that people think that pizza comes frozen and it really doesn't. The pizza places, in order to keep the trust of their customers and to, in order to ensure quality, actually mix the dough locally, like Pizza Hut, Domino's, it's all locally uh, hand mixed and baked right on premises to ensure quality so that when they freeze their pizzas, it does not get frostbitten, it does not get cracked, and you're getting fresh pizza at well, those places a little bit expensive prices that's fresh. Yeah. I have uh, something to add in the history. Actually, uh, Arab flu eating uh, it's, it's not a pizza, it's part of a called naan. And they have been eating for since 800 BC. And the French conquered some of their land, and that's how the French started eating. So it's, it's coming since 800 BC. I guess we should thank Joseph Gullies and then thank God. Because <laughs> thank we're God. We're looking for information on pizza, and the uh, encyclopedia only has about 20, uh, 20 lines dedicated to a $23 billion, you know, $23 billion business in the United States. So uh, most of this information came from the news bank. And uh, it might be interesting if uh, you could send that information to Encyclopedia Britannica because they have almost nothing. So it's really good. Well, yeah. I, I just have one comment. Aren't you forgetting something? Well, the pizza's coming at 20, uh, uh, it's just coming at 20 after, and it was uh, donated by Noodleman. 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 He's got five pizzas. Well, that's coming about 20, about 12, 20. Now I'd like to uh, introduce Mr. Uh, Susan. Are we going? Do we have time? I, what happened to hmm. your? Uh, we had the outline, but the yeah. paper, the laser printer messed it up. We're just trying to rush here. <laughs> hey, it's a, it's a talk. We, we are getting out, what are the uh, ethical considerations for automated pizza and taking away jobs of working in America? <laughs> well, basically, I think if you look at our statistical information that we presented today, the pizza business is increasing so much that they still, that with that phenomenal, phenomenal growth that you saw there, you're talking 1,000 stores <laughs> pizza I've added in two years. They're, they're out, I mean, since there's so much demand, they're just hiring more employees even though there's automation. The 2,000 stores, you just can't put all robots in there. You gotta, you gotta put people in there along with those robots, and you have people making those robotic pizza ovens too. Robotic but pizza. But is the is the pizza oven that you're talking about? Is that really taking away jobs? Because it, it creates actually. Because you you're not. I mean, it's the same person. It's just yeah. It's it's the person who puts it in and checks it, then you have or he just puts it on. And, yeah. Okay. So I don't know that it actually does reduce. So it has a load of does Bill Clinton have a pizza plan? Does uh, <laughs> Bill Clinton have a pizza plan? I'm not, I don't know. I think it's one of those key strategies because of the phenomenal <laughs> stuff that has been sure it it <laughs> It's going to be. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. This is, this, is Bill, this is Bill Clinton. There is going to be a pizza tax. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I believe so Bill Clinton is paying over six million dollars a year to have a uh, kitchen in the White House catered to his meal, but he ordered out of McDonald's at one of the international meetings. Isn't that true, Mr. Right. Wise? <laughs> why, why not pizza? <laughs> <laughs> pizza. It shows you Democrats are not in tune with the American public.
Are we doing it? Okay. Are we doing it? I think we're doing it. Well, the class is officially over, but like I guess it's like, like no, extended. This is, this is an extended. Oh, good. Wednesday is extended. Thursday. Just don't take five minutes. Go. Go. Well, if we take. I'm going. What are you doing? We're going to go to a class this week. We have to do that anyway. Well, are you talking, Vince? What? Are you talking? Somebody better talk now. One, two, three, time's up, get out. No, we're good. We're going, we're going. The pizza comes on. See ya. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now that you're done taking the blackboard, Vince. What? I don't know about this prompt service, Mike. Yeah, average delivery time is going down the tube. You know, actually, you call the I think that we should have gotten a handout that had all those pizza places, the prices, and the phone numbers of those pizza places. That would have been very helpful. Stan, Stan reminds me all the time about uh, paper consumption in the United States. So, <laughs> so I, I want paper so why do they use paper pizza boxes? I don't know. Well, they, they, do. Not they use plastic and the EPA is going to go nuts. They use paper somebody else is going to go nuts. They're going to serve it on nothing. Well, well, then I... Uh, I guess it, the way to plan is to leave them out of liquor. No one is complaining about liquor. You know what I mean? Besides, okay. No one might just price them out of cement. Is the best, the best quality, and the truth, or the middleman? Okay. Whose is not the best quality? I'll get out of here. They burn their pizza all the time. Okay, should we roll? I think we should go now. Roll my. We're waiting. We're waiting for you. Hello. My name is Vincent Chida, and this is my research assistant, Samir Siddiqui. And today we're going to discuss something that is a technical topic. Technical topic. <laughs> the search we're going to discuss today is the search. <laughs> <laughs> forget it, forget it. It's a pizza here now. Can they finish? No, we'll, we'll do it Monday, I guess. I don't know. Do I go with this moment? Why, why don't you keep going? You can eat pizza. We can listen. Yeah, you can eat pizza while you talk. Oh, yeah, right. That would be really good. Yeah. One for left. Yeah, we got three right here. Yeah, yeah one for left. Right. 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 I just leave mine over here. Yeah, hey, put it right there. Should I just play? Uh, I don't remember. If every lab was here, I guess. Okay, let's start this over. We're going to have slices. Don't worry, Vince. Talk what you want. No one's listening. <laughs> <laughs> so, my name is Vincent Chuda. I'm just my lab partner, Amir Siddiqui. Oh, our pizza is going to be cold when we get to it. <laughs> Today we're going to be discussing the circuit and equipment we're using to, to detect light using cadmium sulfide cells. Now, essentially, there's three, so let me take over camera, there's three uses that we have for the circuit. The first and most basic one is to sense objects. What we have is we have the cadmium sulfide cell hooked into some circuitry, which my partner has driven uh, on the board, which we'll discuss later. And we have that for this, for this use shielded and a plastic case, a plastic tube. And what happens is we have that set up so that if the space here for, for a certain range, which we can adjust, is clear, we get zero volts coming out of the circuitry. And if an object or something blocks the tube and light doesn't get into the cell, the voltage on the output jumps to 5 volts. Well, the immediate use for this, obviously, is to take the robot. That's about the scale of the wheels that are on this thing. And put the sensors here, here, and here. Then instead of having to always hit something to detect an object and slow down the robot, you can steer clear of objects before you even touch them. The second use is to use the, the cells in the same circuit, identical circuit, with the, by adjusting the resistance, you can tune it into a device to detect the metal strip at the end of the maze. And this was an idea given to us by Dr. Spoletta. We take it to another tube, a slightly larger tube, and um, we put a divider in it about halfway down the tube. So this would look like this from the side. And one side 
we put a green light emitting diode, and on the other side we put a cadmium sulfide cell. So what happens is, the light from the diode will shine down, but this won't see it coming from the side. It'll only see what's reflected back off the ground. So when we finally cross the strip, the light that's reflected will increase greatly, and we can adjust it so that that will detect the metal strip. The final use for the circuit is for counting the actual um, docking station. We can adjust this so it has a pretty far range. I don't think we've actually ever come up with the fact of what the actual maximum range is, but we can get several feet of sensitivity out of this. So what we can do is, with the back, there's going to be a light behind us. The very bright right here. And these will appear almost completely black. So if you set up a sensor to read about here, you can simply have it look for a light and dark and count off the bases until you get to the one that your block is at. Now, how did we implement this? And how did we get it to work? What problems did we have? For that, I'm going to turn you over to my partner, Amit Siddiqui. Right. My name is Amit Siddiqui. The problem, the circuit which I had built a month ago, the problem, main problem was the port which we used over here. This circuit was valid for a small area of ohms, and the rest of the port, when you switch, change it to its, its variable, it didn't work. And the whole circuit was just lying over there doing nothing. So I had to. Uh, play with the resistances and lower the port so when you even start with it going from 0 ohm to 100 ohm the circuit is actually working in there if you decrease and increase this it will increase and decrease the resistance even if you go almost to 0 ohm it will still detect a uh, object or a light. Uh, the closest we could find an object was few centimeters and millimeters. The furthest I have calculated was four feet. We can get see it any source of light or any passing object in front of it. Voltage divider was the main crucial point because what happens that if you didn't have the port right and your voltage divider is on 0 0.9 volt and your port is not right, it, it jumps very fast from 0 0.6 or 0 0.8 volts to uh, 1.9 or 2 volts. So I had to control that also because if you are going to see something, it should be in a, almost in a close range of 0.9 volts. And uh, this was one of the major problems I had. Uh, and uh, I made this circuit is now working, and uh, all we put it on the street side on our board has been for telling you guys. And I put a diode in there, and it, if you just move your hand across it, it senses it, senses it just like that. And it's very quick also. So. The crucial thing about the race is to be fast and the sensor should be fast also. This was the main, uh, uh, the circuit was, uh, is there anything else I have to talk about? <laughs> uh, any question that somebody has? Why, why was this an integral part of the line? What, how is this going to help it? How's this going to help you navigate better than if you hit the wall? What, what do you the main tendency is if 
we are going to hit the wall, why don't we just avoid it in the first place? And if we go in a race and we hit the wall, like for 20 times, we, we have to dodge the wall and if we miss by 10 times and 15 times, the, the ball will be faster to the team maneuver through. And, uh, uh, and this, so it especially this one, the one which I constructed before, was uh, giving some problems. And this one is working now, and it can detect the six inch wall. Number two, if you have to actually hit the wall, then you have to stop, back up, and turn. Yeah. If you actually can see the wall before you hit it, you can just turn and then you go. So you've eliminated two moves. But we have a backup system. Uh, and then match and push it off. So if we all, somebody, the board comes into us, then it will at least do something. Okay. Um, we'll take it from the front right here. Uh, with the speed of your robot, do you have enough time to break the point you get your own Well, what's going to happen is when, let's say, the robot's going this way. Here's your wall. Robots going this way, here are the wheels. It senses this wall right about here. You all have to do is stop this one and keep this one running and it's going to curve out of the way. And so you don't need to stop it. Right in front of the desired okay. stroke. There, so you can see what's going on? So instead of, let's say, slamming into the wall, knocking half the parts off the robot, and then reversing this wheel backward and going straight, you can just have it steer clear of the wall. Hopefully. Hopefully. And we are giving a distance of six inches to one feet, the wall will be detected. So it's, we have quite a time to know it. Uh, Another nice thing is it makes it very easy to make this a wall fall, uh, a wall follower yeah. because instead of having your robot keep turning to hit the wall, you can just have the sensor look and go in a straight line. You don't have to go bap, 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 bap and crawl along the wall. You can just drive in a straight line at full speed. Your question, Mr. Anderson. I agree that... Um, you may have cut down on two inches by constantly hitting and backing up, but don't you think you're adding about 14 when the other robots are passing within, within six inches to a foot of you when you're constantly turning? Well, no, you can, pro you can program that a little bit. You can have it look for, say, have it always looking forward first and then having it check the sides or something like that. The odds of it actually being unlucky enough to have robots on all sides of us at all times and have the thing sitting there twitching. Yeah. It's, 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 if they're going to get close enough to us to we'll go in front of the sensors, there's a good chance we would have hit them anyway. So rather than, and you guys know how the robot's built, I'd rather not have it hit anything if you were going to sit there. So <laughs> probably yeah. it's the best thing. <laughs> okay, Stanley. You mentioned using the photo cell to detect the uh, strips in the back. Yes. Um, I know that it, this has been tested under uh, normal light conditions. Have you uh, tested this on site with the fluorescent light flooding the... Uh, this particular circuit, no. No, we haven't tested with the fluorescent light yet, but it should be easier. The contrast will be higher. If, it, if it'll work with really low contrast, higher contrast shouldn't be a problem. Yeah. yeah right. You can adjust well, that. The higher contrast you're talking about um, would be true if the spaces between those uh, bases was a large dark spot. But the problem that you're going to deal with, I assume, uh, using a lens or some other form of um, optical device, is the fact that those bases are thin enough that the light is bending around them and you're getting floods of light the entire time, unless you're within, say, five or six inches of the, uh, the bases, which is at a point where you'll be risking hitting them. Well, <coughs> we can probably, I would, I would assume, put something else behind it. We, we haven't been given any kind of restrictions as far as the base having to be that thin. Well, as far as we have that restriction because the fluorescent light only offers maybe <laughs> twice that width to fit the eight of them across the back wall. Otherwise, you can't fit. Well, still, yeah. twice that fit would eliminate the twice that width would eliminate the flooding. Well, even that way, we, we tested it. Oh, sure. Well, you, did you 
have this circuit working? Because this uh, is I'm talking about just the throw of the photocell itself. The throw of the photocell isn't a whole hell of a lot, even with this, but it works. Ooh. <laughs> what, what, what kind of throw are you talking about? What kind of throw are you talking about? What is it actually changing? Between? It's changing uh, between uh, uh, roughly around 30 to 40 k. 30 to 40 k? Right, uh, the throw that we were talking about here, we're talking about 100 to 200 ohms. That's still standard photo. So you can, you can program that. Yeah. You, can, you can put that you in. You can there. change the board and uh, the sensitivity is completely adjustable. Yeah. You can, you can make it hypersensitive to make it. This lens why, don't you, why don't you hook up one of those circuits on the board real quick this afternoon and we'll test it? We already got it hooked up over here. We can just probably just wave the robot around and test it this afternoon. <laughs> and about the strip, which, 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 which was saying, uh, it can, uh, if you have a, even a light source of bulb and you pass a pencil through it, it can detect that. Even though the light is coming across it, but pencil can't even be. Does the light in the room have anything to do with it? It's supposed to turn the light down. Uh, you gotta, you got to tune it in when you get to the room yeah. itself? Yep. That's why we have a portal. Uh -huh. Well, so when you so you're detecting the strip and put a pencil in it, it'll pick that up? Uh, if it's a little bit shining, I mean, if you have a light source of something, if you cross a pencil through it, it will detect that. So it can detect the shining object, yeah. Anything on the floor. Thus far, we've got the floor itself. This, this far, thus no. far, we've, well, the floor itself, no matter where you're going, it's going to be less reflective than the strip. Because the shape would be the The whole thing is going to be aluminum foil. Yes, so yeah. dark <laughs> if the whole floor is aluminum foil, nothing's going to work in here. Except they're using photos. Yeah. Yeah. They're tuning their photos on these I mean, the diffusion of light, so I say it's diffusion of problem around objects. Not so far. We haven't had any problem with it so far. We tested it in a lot of different ways, and yeah. it's just been working. Does this work? What? In the hallway is working. We haven't, um, we've been having a couple problems with when stuff breaking on it, so we haven't had, you know, not, not, not physically, not in the structure, just in the, some of the circuitry. So we've gotten that problem straightened out, and we hope, you know, after we get like stuff like the E&M labs done and stuff like that, that we'll have it running perhaps by tomorrow. We'll have yeah, everything what kind of cells are you using? Not cadmium sulfide, but how big are they? Um, small size. Small size. Small size. The, the real small one is the straw? <coughs> yeah. Those things? Mm -hmm. yeah. There's a specific one. There's a couple like there's a couple grades of the smaller ones. There's, these are slightly different than the standard. Standard really small ones. There's some that are really thin. These are slightly thicker but smaller. So I don't know what the difference is. Probably just a slightly different electrical quality to them. Uh, any other question? I say that because you just said the phenomenal job today is because the double speed was the small. You did a good job today. One thing you might uh, want to note is the adjustment on the comparator, which is also going to give you the distance. You can put a real simple B to A converter on there and then be able to adjust that sensitivity on the fly. Yeah, so that, uh, for instance, you could put it down, let it run over the strip, and it would, would adjust to it, or it would adjust to just varying conditions in the room. Or if you wanted to adjust the bumper distances, for instance, if you said you wanted to go down the hall, and for the first half of the maze, you wanted to stay you know, a foot away from the wall. And then the last half of the maze, you wanted to stay a half a foot away from the wall, or a quarter of a foot away from the wall. You could adjust the sensitivity by adjusting the voltage. Would there be a great deal of advantage to that? Is that a hint that the maze is tighter on the front end? Or? No, no I'm, I'm saying as an example, something that you should be aware of, and, and it's really simple to do. All you would do is take a few output lines and tie them in through resistors to that input. 
and essentially you're creating a voltage divider that you're spoiling. Yeah. And so you can have a real simple circuit to say, um, and I'm not really sure that there is a reason to do it in this project, but for your own use, one one may be, let's say when you go down the, you have a wall follower and you want to stay within um, three centimeters or two centimeters of the wall all the way down. But then when you want to turn and you want to look for the, the station, you want to stay 12 centimeters away or, or, or 15 centimeters away. Well, then when you turn, you have to adjust the sensitivity and then continue with your original program, which would keep it that much further away. Any other questions? There was one thing else I wanted to add. Uh, you're using over here a black uh, five times thing, plastic, and if you put a photo cell in, you can increase and decrease the distance by that also. If you put it closer, the sensitivity decreases by That would also, for instance, affect the directionality. Paul? Tomorrow? Pardon? Four of these Plastic. Friend or foe? Uh, can I talk about Pakistan? <laughs> they can talk about pizza. <laughs> sure. Um, I have a question. Uh, what are you making the boundary? Two by fours. All the way down? Yep. 20 feet wide, right? 40, 40, 40 feet wide. 40 feet long. No, 40, 40 feet, feet long. 40 feet long. 40. Eight. Eight. Everything is multiples of eight foot two by fours. Every dimension. Yeah. 40 feet long. Yeah. That's 20 feet wide. The actual maze, is it going to be a maze or is it going to be an obstacle course? Is there going to be like a box in front of us? Or is it going to be a series, just a series of two by fours like you're looking down at edges? It's. It really depends on how much time we have and how energetic we are. <laughs> but typically what we do is if you lay out the one two by four across and the five two by four is lengthwise, you can do the main. Nail those together. And then you have pieces. You have pieces and you nail know, one there, you go like this, one across like this. Maybe like this, like that. Up there. <laughs> okay? And then we'll get some computer paper boxes and sit them, sit one here, stack up a couple here, and here. The idea being that those boxes that hold the whole thing in one spot. So you do that. That's what it looks like. I think the question we have to have before is this one here? Is there going to be an island? The HC? Yeah, sometimes I'll put one like that. In the beginning, so the wall followers thing, beginning of the bubble. You're not going to pull something crazy, are you? Like uh, four islands surrounding one another. Really? I'm coming out. I'm coming out. I'm coming out. Okay, is this, is this going to be 8 here and 40 here? Yeah. Yeah.